You probably heard that uh, history tends to repeat itself. And uh, I do have to agree in a way that there are many past events that uh, seemingly tend to reoccur and uh, they happen like every every once in a while, almost like in a cyclical manner. So 100 years ago, there was the Spanish flu, uh, which is also considered one of the most uh, widespread pandemics uh, of history. So uh, this episode is going to be talking about the Spanish flu of 1918. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. It's an online learning platform with thousands of courses on various fields like creativity, animation, graphic design, data science, web development, business analytics, project management and so much more. There's also classes on cooking, entrepreneurship, photography and crafting. It's the perfect place to get invaluable life skills as well as business ideas to make a living with. The teachers are all experts in their field and the videos are very easy to comprehend. Skillshare has classes to fit your schedule and skill level. The first 1000 people who use the link in the description will get two months free of Skillshare Premium. In 1918, the world went through one of the deadliest pandemics in history, the Spanish flu. It lasted for 36 months until the year 1920. It infected 500 million people, which was about one third of the world's population at that time. At least 50 million people died, possibly up to 100, so it was quite deadly. The Spanish flu was an especially deadly influenza type virus with a high mortality rate amongst young adults. Nearly half the deaths happened between the ages 20 and 40, so people in their prime years were most affected by it, which is quite the opposite to what we have uh, nowadays. Uh, it was thought that this was caused by an inflammatory cytokine storm created by the body in response to the infection that uh, basically ravages the immune system and leaves the person more vulnerable to respiratory failure and uh, pneumonia. Uh, people who got infected, they started showing adverse symptoms within hours. They got extreme fatigue, high fever, loss of appetite, headaches, and uh, they sometimes even started to turn blue. Coughing would often cause foamy blood to be expelled from the mouths as well as noses. Many victims died within 24 hours of showing first symptoms, so there wasn't many asymptomatic carriers, so to say. The lethality was exacerbated by the poor living conditions of most people at that time. You see, most countries were also fighting in World War I, and uh, therefore the population was more malnourished and uh, medical facilities were already slightly overcrowded. Soldiers living in muddy trenches close quarters to each other with virtually no access to proper hygiene or medical treatment also contributed to the high death count in their age cohort. And yeah, it's quite crazy to think about that you're a soldier sitting in this trench in this mud. You don't really have a lot of food. You're cold, you're tired, you're wet. And oh yeah, there's also this killer virus going about and you can also be killed by enemy mortars and uh, other other like bullets and what what not so it's kind of a very quite a good thing to keep in mind in terms of that because the world war 1 is probably the worst war you would ever want to be in and yeah like it happened to have a virus this virus didn't actually originate from spain as the name would like you to think instead the spanish government was the only country that is that was reporting its prevalence in the global news because uh, they were neutral in uh, World War I. The other countries, they were fighting in the war and they just suppressed their numbers and they didn't report it uh, in a, like a more accurate way because uh, it was like valuable inv information to their enemies. Over the course of two years, the Spanish flu went through three major waves with the second one being the most deadly. While the first wave, which started at January 1918, resembled previous flu epidemics, the second wave was much worse because of the trench warfare. The third wave began in January 1919 and lasted until June 1919. After World War I ended in November 1918, people celebrated and they rejoiced on the streets, which um, enabled the infection to spread more rapidly because they ignored all the social distancing and they were like hugging and kissing each other and uh, that kind of uh, offset the second wave. 
Everyday life was severely hampered by the pandemic. A lot of stores shut down, schools were closed, the economy suffered, and public gatherings of multiple people were prohibited. The major pandemic came to an end around late 1919, with some people still dying early 1920. There's a tendency for influenza viruses to mutate into less lethal strains over the course of time, as more dangerous ones die out. It had also killed a lot of the most vulnerable members of the population, which slowed down the spread. When the majority of the population becomes immune to the virus, it has less victims to infect and eventually dies out. However, it might also mutate into more lethal strains, and the people could also never become immune. So we don't really know how a, how a particular virus is going to act. In 1920, travel was also a lot more limited. Flying was still in its infancy, and people traveled primarily by ships or cars. So there wasn't that much global migration, aside from the soldiers who were actually thought to spread the flu across the globe initially. After World War I has ended at the end of 1918, there was a seven-month post-war recession that shrunk the economy by about 25%. It was caused by both the pandemic as well as the high cost of war. A second, much more severe recession happened in 1920, often called the Depression. It lasted until 1921. Germany suffered the most during the aftermath of World War I, as they also received severe repressions from the winning countries. In 1921, the total reparation sum was set at 132 billion gold marks which is about $25 billion at that time. However, Germany didn't have the funds to pay that much money, and uh, they ended up paying only 50 billion gold marks, which was uh, $12.5 billion. However, the aftermath of World War I ushered in what's called the Roaring Twenties. This rapid growth was partly caused by resources shifting from wartime production to peacetime production that focuses on improving the economy and increased consumption of consumer goods. In many democratic societies, women also won the right to vote. The Roaring Twenties was brought to a halt by the Wall Street crash of 1929, which led to the Great Depression worldwide. It's the longest and most severe economic depression of the 20th century. On the 4th of September 1929, the US stock market began to see a massive fall in prices, eventually leading to a worldwide crash on October 29. It was also known as the Black Tuesday. Investors traded about 16 million shares in a single day. Billions of dollars were lost. People were panic selling as they saw their wealth disappear into nothingness. Between 1929 and 1932, GDP across the world fell by about 15%. In comparison, the 2008 crash saw a drop of only 1%. Unemployment in the US soared to 23%, and in some countries it was at 33%. Millions of people lost their jobs, lost their homes, and were barely making ends meet. By the Great Depression, Germany had paid only 20.5 billion gold marks in reparations. The reparations were suspended by international community in 1932. The Weimar Republic, as it was called back then, went through inflation beginning since the end of World War I, but it reached hyperinflation during the Great Depression. They were printing money that was losing its value with every hour. It was basically worthless, and it was more valuable to use it as wallpaper rather than to make payments with. In 1933, Adolf Hitler attained power in Germany as he was appointed chancellor. He had fought in World War I and joined the German Workers' Party in 1919. The name was changed to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or known as the Nazi Party. Adolf Hitler is one of the most known person of the 20th century, as he's considered to be greatly responsible for starting World War II. The Russian Empire also saw a socialist revolution in 1917, led by Vladimir Lenin. There was a brutal civil war between Reds, or the Communists, and Whites, who represented the Confederation. In 1923, the Reds won, who then established a socialist dictatorship, killing millions of people. These kind of dramatic revolutions and populism usually happen as a result of some crisis like famine, the plague, pandemics, or war. Because a lot of people lost their jobs and income, Many nations weakened by World War I saw a rise in populism and socialist movements. This was especially predominant in Germany, who was already in economic ruins after the war. 
there's a lot of lessons to learn from the World War I era and the following years. Hopefully, we can use history to not make those same mistakes. First, pandemics come in several waves. They're constantly mutating and adapting to new conditions. In cases of the Spanish flu as well as the Black Death, the first wave was the least deadly. The second and third wave are almost always more lethal. Second, major crises like pandemics and war are followed up by depressions. They may not be that severe, but you can almost always expect minor contractions as the countries have to recover from wartime efforts. Third, after a depression, the economy tends to go for an upturn. Everything is cyclical. Downtimes are followed by growth as the economy recovers. People regain some of their belief in the economy and they start spending their money again. But next, four, major economic growth and upturn isn't permanent. Nothing can not keep growing exponentially forever. There's going to have to be some market corrections and drawbacks. If something keeps expanding with no signs of drawing back, then rest assured it's a bubble and it's going to pop soon. That's exactly what happened in 1929 when the stock market crashed under its own weight. This then led to an economic disaster, the Great Depression, that lasted for several years and financially crippled millions of people worldwide. 5. Great depressions and recessions tend to lead to an increase in populism and nationalistic movements. People are facing financial struggle and they seek help in socialism and communism. Unfortunately, history shows it doesn't work in the long term. One of the biggest food shortages of the 20th century happened in Soviet Russia and Maoist China, where millions of people starved to death. And lastly, strong nationalistic ideologies and economic depressions can lead to wars. Dictators like Hitler and Stalin believed so much in their superiority that they wanted to conquer other regions and become even more powerful. Although war does require a lot of resources and money, it is also a powerful stimulus for the economy and industry. Germany, as well as the US, dragged themselves out of the Great Depression thanks to orienting their industry towards military equipment, weapons, tanks, missiles, etc. So there is a financial incentive for people to wage war, at least to a certain extent, at least every once in a while. World War I was the Great War, the Spanish flu was the Great Influenza, and the market crash after the Roaring Twenties was the Great Depression. These are one of the most defining events of history, at least of the 20th century. Arguably, they all brought forth an even greater crisis, World War II. I'm not saying that the Spanish flu caused World War II, but it did contribute to the other events that led to this war. World War III would be a disaster, and I think no one could comprehend what kind of destruction it would create. Even if there won't be a war, political turmoil and conflict will still keep rising. We're probably going to see more rise in populism as we did during the Great Depression because people are suffering financially as well as emotionally. History tends to repeat itself way too often and uh, we should learn from it as much as possible. So share this podcast around and let's become aware of the potential catastrophe we might be facing unless we take precautionary measures against it. So thanks for listening. If you want to support us, then leave us a review on iTunes and the other podcast apps. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.